I want your soul. I've been in and out of prisons and jails ever since I was 17. I thought I had seen it all. Aryan Brotherhood members stabbing guards, gang wars, escapes, and torture. I saw many things that still give me nightmares to this day. McDonald, 402202, the guard barked out. I jumped up, the thin mattress under me, exhaling a whiff of stale air. I looked through the bars, seeing Correctional Officer Shea. C.O. Shea was a morbidly obese man with a penchant for being loud and lazy. I had seen a member of the Bloods punch him straight in the nose before, a scene I still remembered with some humor. Shea had crumpled like wet paper on the floor, screaming and crying as more C.O.s ran over and tackled the inmate. Yeah? I asked. And Shea handed me a sheet of paper. He regarded me with gray, colorless eyes. Congratulations. You're being transferred. Now pack your shit. This is your last day at Springfield Correctional Center. You might think I would be happy to get a transfer. SCC was, after all, a total fucking shithole. The food was terrible and always cold. The place always smelled like bleach and chemicals. And at night... It got so cold with my old flimsy sheet that I regularly woke up shivering. The building itself was nearly a century old, and the fact that it still functioned at all was a miracle in itself. But to be honest, I wasn't thrilled about the transfer. I had made friends here and knew the lay of the land. I didn't have to worry about getting jumped or stabbed to death in the showers. As the old adage goes, it's better the devil you know than the one that you don't. I was let out of my cell the next evening with all the worldly possessions I owned, which fit neatly into a clear trash bag with room to spare. I owned some prison clothes, toothpaste, a toothbrush, deodorant, a Bible, a pair of sandals, and a radio. I felt the unbearable lightness of my existence reflected in that bag as it smacked rhythmically against my leg. Good luck, Josh. A rather insane acquaintance of mine named Alvin called out from his cell as I passed down the bleak, concrete hallway. Take care, man. I hope we meet again on the outside, I said, waving, knowing that I would almost certainly never see any of these people again. Hell, I hadn't even seen my own family in over five years now. None of them came to visit me anymore. No one wrote me letters or put money in my commissary account or sent me books to read. It was like I was gone for real. And that's the way it is sometimes. We're all born alone, and we all die alone, I thought to myself as C.O. Shea walked by my side. He was breathing heavily, as if he had just finished running a marathon. I looked over at his face, seeing the burst capillaries on his nose from years of hard drinking and the squint of his little piggy eyes. There was a slight gleam of intelligence and slyness behind that ugly mug, though. Well, amigo, he said in his slow, plodding way, I got a sign to go with you. I'll be your ride along, buddy. So you excited or what? I smiled faintly at him. There are worse people than you here, Shay. Far worse, I said. I got on the prison bus in my bright orange jumpsuit. To my surprise, I saw the back was nearly empty. There was only one other prisoner in the back. Shay sat with us to monitor us. We were also handcuffed and ankle cuffed, and a chain ran down and connected the two. I looked over at the other prisoner, a black guy with a shaved head. I think he also shaved his eyebrows. I mean, I literally didn't see a single hair on his head besides eyelashes, which he apparently hadn't found a way to shave yet. Sup, he said, and I nodded. We sat there in awkward silence as Shay plopped down hard on the bench between us. He'd grown like a confused old man. So what do you know about this place, Shay? I asked. And he sucked down half a bottle of coke and then heaved a deep sigh. I don't know much about it, to be frank, he admitted. Apparently it's brand new. They asked us to send a couple people who met certain criteria, he said. What does that mean? The black guy asked, and Shay gave him a serious look. Come on, Timmy, you know what I mean. Hardened criminals. 
people with long records who tour prisons like some people tour French beaches. Well, I can tell you one thing. There are far worse people than me in prison, I said. Well, they ask for no murderers or gangbangers too. I don't know why. I don't know what the criterion is. But maybe it's some new government program. Apparently they call it an experimental prison. What about me? Timmy asked. And Shay apparently knew what he meant. You're not a murderer, Timmy, Shay said, his lips forming the faintest twitch of a smile. Well, there was that one time my girlfriend got me to drop some acid with her. She went and killed her parents, and then we hit the road, Timmy said fondly, his eyes rising as if we were looking at a hovering angel in the far-off distance. Well, you were never convicted of any accessory charges, so that doesn't count, Shay retorted. Oh, it counts, Timmy dawled in a slow, plodding way. It counts. Everything in life always counts. If I've learned anything in the last 36 years, it's that you can never truly escape anything you've done, good or bad, he said. I couldn't see much from the prison van. There was a small, shatterproof window in the swinging back doors, but it only gave a fleeting view of what was behind us. I noticed the dark forest stretching out to the horizon over the rolling hills. We drove for a few hours, the three of us bullshitted, talking about everything from sports to politics to the recent spate of fatal stabbings at SCC. Then I felt the van stop, and I looked out the back window, seeing more endless trees. I didn't see a single house or car on the road we had taken. This place is a ghost town, I said, and Shay nodded. Yeah, it's as dead as Frank Sinatra around here. He wheezed out a high-pitched laugh at his own joke. This area used to be big for coal mining, but as it dried up and people lost their jobs, they moved away. You know, come to think of it, my grandfather was a coal miner. Good place to build a prison, huh? Timmy asked. If there's nobody around, then. We were then cut off by a clanging alarm up ahead. I had heard something large moving, probably the gate opening. And then we drove inside. I saw the guard towers and rolls of razor wire for a brief moment as the van pulled into an open garage. The darkness immediately blanketed us. The garage door slowly rolled shut behind us and Shay jumped up. Let's get you boys inside so I can take off your handcuffs and everything, he said, motioning for us to follow. He then pulled out a flashlight from his belt, guiding us through the pitch black darkness. The dim light sent shadows racing across the room like groping tentacles. I caught glimpses of strange objects in the darkness, and they looked like medieval torture devices, which was very odd. Those look like torture devices on that table, Shay. I think those bloody things are thumbscrews, and that might be a pair of anguish. My voice trailed off, and I pointed to the pear-shaped object with three wicked blades whose points came together sitting on a dusty shelf. The ornate handle had springs connected to it. The object could be forced into any human orifice, and when the springs were engaged, it would open like a flower inside the person's body, ripping their flesh apart and enlarging that orifice to a bloody, gaping hole. How do you know so much about this? Shay asked, giving me a strange look. He narrowed his little piggy eyes. He continued to fumble with the flashlight, peering around for a door to exit the garage. I looked back at the car and saw the driver just sitting there, his entire body as lifeless and still as a mannequin. Me? I've read a few books, I said as Timmy interrupted us. I see a little red light glowing under that door, he said, and Shay focused his flashlight on the spot. Across the room, I noticed what Timmy was pointing at. It was an ancient-looking black door. The wood had started to crack and splinter down the middle. Engraved in silver on the front, it said, Entrance to North Frost Penitentiary. Hello? Is anybody there? Shay called toward the door as the three of us moved forward, the steel chains giving my steps a clinking rhythm. Shay reached the antique crystal doorknob, and Timmy and I stood next to a dust-covered brazen bull its bronze mouth wide open as if it were silently roaring at us. As Shea pulled open the door, crimson light flooded into the garage. Tinted black glass covered the back wall. A speaker button sat next to the window, 
and I looked to my right, seeing a massive sign sprawled across the wall there, and it read, Rules for Conduct at North Frost Penitentiary. Rule number one, the COs without faces don't work here, and we don't know who they are. If you see one, press one of the buttons labeled Emergency Dispatch that are scattered around the complex. Rule number two, when the red emergency lights come on, hide until they shut off. Rule number three, do not enter into the medical ward for any reason. It does not matter if you need medical attention or not. Rule number four, the warden roams the prison every night at 3.33 a.m. looking for human meat. Do not let him catch you. What the fuck is this? A goddamn joke? Timmy asked, his dark face forming into a scowl. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Shay rubbed the back of his neck, looking like an obese little boy who lost his parents. I've never been here before, but this is all a little unusual, I'll admit. A buzzing came from the back of the room, and suddenly a garish, echoing intercom turned on. Please remove their chains and direct them through the door on your left, a female robotic voice said calmly in a tone as cool as lemonade on a hot day. Your transfer will then be complete. Shay then sighed in relief. Good, good, okay. This place gives me the creeps. Bro, you can't leave us here, Timmy protested. What the fuck is this place, and where is everybody? And why the fuck is there a room filled with bloody ancient torture devices next to the garage? Shay then put up his hands. I'm sorry, you guys, but I have orders. I'm just a messenger here, okay? I was told to transfer you here, and that's what I've done. He then fumbled around his belt for his key ring. He came over and unlocked the handcuffs and ankle cuffs from both of us, and I stretched, rubbing my wrists. I was glad to finally be out of those suffocating restraints. Yeah, all right, Shay. Well, thanks for everything then, I said, picking up my extremely light garbage bag of possessions and heading for the door on the left. Timmy reluctantly followed behind, and a sign on this door read, Welcome to General Population. But when we got to the other side and it slammed shut behind us, I found a hallway filled with more red emergency lights streaming down. An involuntary shiver ran through my body. I remembered those absurd rules that somebody had put up. What had it said about red lights? My mind raced for a few moments and then the answer popped up. It said to hide. I then heard a man shrieking up ahead, his voice riddled with agony and terror. The hallway split to the right and left and I couldn't see anyone. And Timmy and I stopped. Dude, fuck this. Timmy said, turning and running back toward the door we had come through. He tried pulling it open, but it was firmly locked. The scream came again, louder and closer, but this time it was cut off suddenly. I heard somebody gurgling like a man with a slit throat trying to breathe, and then everything went deathly silent again. The gray concrete floor of the hallway had arrows pointing forward on it. There were no doors here. There was nowhere to hide that I could see. Timmy and I reluctantly went forward. As we got to the intersection, we saw the dead body of a man in a brown khaki uniform. His sightless eyes remained open. They stared up at the ceiling, glassy and still filled with horror. Deep gouge marks bit deeply into the flesh on his back and arms and chest. His throat had been cut or bit open as well, and a spreading puddle of blood encircled his body. I saw a dark blur at the end of the hallway on the right. It looked a little more like a shadow. I whispered to Timmy, pointing, and we decided to go left immediately. My heart was pounding at this point, and I felt like a soldier walking through the no-man's land of a war zone. I was expecting an attack to come at any moment. The hallway to the left had some doors at it, and I sprinted forward as quietly as I could with Timmy close by my side. I read the first door, and it said, To Medical Ward. Uh, no, we're not doing that, I whispered, moving on to the second one. Then, I heard light footsteps behind me. Turning, I saw a creature from a nightmare sneaking up on us in the bloody glow 
of the emergency lights. Its skin was black and shiny like that of a centipede's. I was shocked looking at it. In its general form, it reminded me of a hairless werewolf, and it towered over us, its eyes like bone-white cataracts, its claws as long and sharp as a dagger. And yet its face seemed almost reptilian. It had two small nose holes like a snake in a jaw that unhinged and dropped far below its head. I saw rows of blood-soaked fangs. It gave off a low, gurgling growl that emanated from its chest. With a rush of adrenaline and a sense of mortal terror, I pushed through the second door without reading the sign on the front. Timmy was right behind me and I heard him screaming as he fell into me. I suddenly found myself in a prison dormitory, and we weren't alone. As I hit the ground, I saw a white face peering out at me from behind the bunk bed. The man hiding there saw the abomination behind us and got up, screaming and running away. The creature growled, giving chase after us, and in two powerful bounds, it had rushed across the dormitory and grabbed the man by the neck. I looked back at Timmy, in awe, seeing him groaning on the ground. Blood poured from deep cuts on his back, and I grabbed him, pulling him up quickly. Let's go, let's go, let's go, no time. My voice was then cut off by the sound of a neck snapping. I looked back, seeing the creature had twisted the man's head around in a circle, and it raised the limp body to its massive mouth and severed the head in a single powerful bite. We need to get the fuck out of here, man, please, Timmy whispered as I pulled him back out into the hallway. I looked over, seeing another werewolf creature bounding down the hallway, chasing a man in a prison jumpsuit, and I knew I had no choice. I pulled Timmy toward the door labeled Medical Ward, and with a creak of rusted hinges, it opened, and we went inside to hide. Maybe there's something in here we can use to bandage you up, ma'am, I said to Timmy, pulling him down the short hallway toward a room filled with single beds. I didn't know why the rules said to avoid this place. It looked totally empty. Against the back wall, I saw a glass cabinet filled with bandages, rubbing alcohol, band-aids, and other various first aid supplies. I ran toward it, and Timmy limped along after me, still groaning. God damn, man, I think those claws went down to the bone, he said. It's going to be all right. I pulled out some antiseptic and bandages, adding, it could have been a lot worse, and the universe would immediately prove me right. I heard a slight giggling from under one of the beds, and Timmy and I both froze when we heard it. Two rotted hands reached out, dragging the mutilated body of a little girl behind them. She had patches of garish black stitches running across her face, hands, and arms. Dark clotted blood dripped from the sights, and she wore a gore-smeared hospital gown with no eyes. I looked into her empty sockets, and they stared back at me like two black holes spinning in the void. As she rose to her feet, her giggles became full-blown laughter, a hysterical gurgling like the laugh of a dying person, and then she ran at me. I saw the silver gleam of a scalpel in her little hand, and she was on a murderous rampage. I screamed, raising my hands to protect myself, but the scalpel came down, slicing across my palm. It cut me deeply, burning, and a cold pain ran up my arm. I repressed the urge to scream, but I was totally terrified. At that moment, the red emergency lights flicked off. Bright fluorescent lights popped on, flickering and strobing in rapid succession. Timmy charged forward, tackling the undead girl, but I saw more small hands reaching out from under the beds as well hands filled with sores and squirming larvae, and I could see the bones of their hands through necrotic patches eaten into their flesh. I ran for Timmy, grabbing him and hauling him up. We need to go. We need to get the fuck out of this ward now, I screamed, pulling him forward as more undead boys and girls rose up, all with sharp knives and surgical instruments grasped in their little hands. Suddenly, I felt a pain in my leg, and I looked down, seeing a knife sticking out of my thigh. The empty eye sockets of a little boy's face stared up at me, grinning like a skull. I immediately collapsed on the ground as we were surrounded. I prayed to God then, knowing that we would die. 
I prayed that he would forgive me for all my mistakes, because I was on a fast track to the afterlife, and would be seeing him in a few seconds. With a sharp cry of pain, I yanked the knife out of my leg and turned it on my attacker. And then, a gunshot rang out. The head of the nearest girl exploded in a shower of bone fragments and dead maggots, and I looked up to my left, seeing Shay standing at the door, his pistol raised in the air. Come on, come on, you idiots, let's go now, he screamed. Timmy and I didn't need any more encouragement. As Shay continued to blow apart the nearest of the undead abominations, we limped and scrambled towards him. My leg gave a shriek of pain with every step, but I knew I had to make it. We immediately got out of the medical ward, battered and bruised, but still alive. Why'd you come back, Shay? I asked through pained breaths, and he gave me a frantic look. Well, when I got back to the car, the driver was dead. His throat was ripped out or something, I don't know. I grabbed his keys and came back for you two. I don't know where the fuck we are, but I'm getting you guys out of here. I looked at him in amazement. I had never thought in a million years Shay would risk his life for some scumbag inmates. Yeah, all right, but what's the plan? Timmy asked, sweating heavily, his eyes wild and pained. How are we going to get out of here without dying? Shay looked at us and shrugged. The door locked behind us when we came in here, I said. Unless we can break it down and get back to the car, I don't know what we're going to do. We passed by buttons labeled emergency dispatch under glowing red emergency signs, and I wondered if we could get help somehow through them. Halt! Someone cried from behind us. I looked back, seeing a man in a black correctional officer's uniform. He ran towards us, his hand on his radio, hanging from his belt. But something immediately seemed off about this figure. As he got closer, I quickly realized why. He had no face. His entire head was just smooth white skin, without hair or any signs of features. He spoke out again, and the voice seemed to come from all around his body this time. You all must report to the medical ward, the strange figure said. We do not allow injured people in the hallways. No, 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 we're fine, Shay said, grinning. See, buddy, I work for the DOC, too. And he pointed at the identification clip to his breast pocket. The figure then raised his radio to his lips. We have resistance near Dormitory 1, the fake CO said into his radio before any of us could stop him. Shay then ran forward, knocking the radio from his hand and the CO instantly straightened up and whipped out his pistol, pointing it at Shay's torso. He fired, and I saw Shay's chest explode in a blossoming flower of blood. Timmy was screaming now, running forward, and I saw a silver gleam in his hand, and realized he had taken one of the scalpels from the undead Shay had killed in the medical ward as well. As the fake CO spun to point the pistol at Timmy, he ran into him, stabbing the scalpel deeply into the CO's neck, they fell together with Timmy on top of him. His body weight drove the scalpel deeper into the white, featureless skin. Blood the color of soot spurted from the wound. The gun went off, the bullet missing Timmy entirely and smashing into the ceiling. The CO then started gurgling death gasps, and I grabbed Timmy. Get the guns, I said. They're both dead, and we need their guns. He nodded at me grabbing the CO's gun and taking an extra magazine from his belt. I did the same with Shay's gun and magazine. I pressed the button labeled emergency dispatch as more faceless men appeared far off down the corridor. Then we fled as fast as we could from that hallway, but seeing as we were both in pretty bad shape, it wasn't very fast. At that point, though, I was just glad to be alive. We wandered around the hell prison, avoiding the faceless COs wherever we saw them patrolling the hallways. They would radio to each other, their voices always surrounding their bodies rather than coming from their heads, which I found extremely eerie and unsettling. A couple times, I saw men in black SWAT suits with automatic rifles gunning down the fake COs. I wondered if this was the emergency dispatch. Timmy and I avoided them as well, and we gave a wide berth any time we heard gunfire. We passed several cells with mummified corpses hanging from the ceiling, and we passed dormitories where the victims of the strange werewolf-like creatures littered the floors, rotting and stinking like roadkill. 
Occasionally, I would catch a glimpse of another survivor, a pale face peeking out from some hiding spot, but Timmy and I kept pushing forward, looking for a way out ourselves. Eventually, we wound up in a sprawling gymnasium, sitting down and resting for a few minutes, when we finally encountered the warden. He came in the form of a demonic roar from the hallway, a mixing of many strange and human tongues. As Timmy and I sat up quickly, a decapitated body flew into the gym and a creature from hell followed after it. This was him. This was the warden. The body smacked into the concrete wall with a soft fleshy whack and the warden, he stood ten feet tall. He had on a black correctional officer's uniform and a leather visor cap. His face looked like it had no flesh, only a thick layer of bone covered it with two reptilian eyes peering out from behind slitted pupils. He hissed, a forked tongue shooting out from his gaping maw, and his fingers looked like sharp daggers of bone. A smell like old leather and blood rose from his body. Shoot that motherfucker, I screamed, raising the pistol and firing at its head. The first shot blew off its visor cap, revealing the hairless reptilian skull underneath, but the bullet only gouged the top of its skull, and it ran at us with powerful bounding steps, covering the distance in moments. Timmy and I both began firing as fast as we could as it got within a few feet of us, and it bounded into Timmy like a freight train hitting a car. Timmy's body went flying and smashed against the back wall with the sound of bones shattering. I slammed another magazine into the pistol as the warden turned to me, but I saw that we had hit it. One of its eyes had exploded in a shower of gore and vitreous fluid, and its head was bleeding badly. I raised the gun, aiming for the same eye and firing. The warden then smacked his hand against his face as if he had forgotten something, falling to the floor. I ran forward, putting the pistol point-blank against his ruined eye before emptying the clip and blowing his brains out. By the end, he wasn't moving anymore. Oh, God, man, you look like shit, I said, walking over to Timmy. I saw his shattered legs, his broken spine, and his snapped ribs, and he was coughing up blood. I'm sorry, man. I really am, I said. I saw his head nod slightly as he died, giving a final death gasp before falling still. I went back to the warden and I found a ring of keys on his body. In excitement, I ran downstairs and tried the locked door and it worked. I went into the parking structure and grabbed the van, pulling out the dead driver and starting it up. After smashing through the garage door, I drove it out through the gate. It did catastrophic damage to the prison van, but it got me far enough away before the engine gave out. I'm walking down the highway right now, and I don't know what that kind of prison was, but I hope I never see that hellscape again. And from here on out, I ain't going back. I'm on the run. <laughs>